All right. Thank you for that kind introduction, Steve. Really appreciate it. Good. Okay. So you should all be able to see me clearly on the screen. Just confirming. Great. All right then. So let's talk about stakeholder engagement. Now, US project management professionals, of course, are in the position of wrangling cats all the time. That is the essence of what you do. You need to, as you're managing projects, get a lot of people involved, get them on your team, even though you may not have direct authority over them. And that is a challenge. That's a problem. How do you do that effectively? Because project managers are taught how to manage projects, They're not taught very well how to manage people and how to do this sort of soft skill stuff of managing relationships, engaging with people. So we'll talk about how to do that, specifically for you as project management professionals. We'll talk about some of the mistakes that project managers and other folks make in engaging people first. So that's gonna be the first part of the presentation. And then we'll talk about some of the ways that you can address these mistakes, including some of the key questions that you can ask to address these problems. So that's gonna be the shape of the presentation. Now, without further ado, let's talk about stakeholder engagement. Now, the first thing I'm gonna ask you to think about is imagine, you know, you're gonna get some pizza soon, but imagine that you know, you'll have some dessert as well. So as you imagine you have this dessert, you'll have two options for dessert, two types of ice cream, one that contains 10% fat and one that's 90% fat free. So 10% fat or 90% fat free. Now, which one would you like? You'll see a poll right now so as Steve mentioned, we'll be doing quite a bit of polling. Please vote for which of these you would prefer. You can see it on your phone or not, uh, or you're on your laptop if you're on your laptop. Please vote, 10% fat or 90% fat. Free. Okay, give five more seconds for those who haven't voted yet. Most of us have. All right. So as we can see, just about two thirds would prefer 90% fat free and one just about over a third would prefer 10% fat. Now, if you think about it, these are the same things. 90% fat free means it's 10% fat. 10% fat means it's 90% fat free. But most people have a preference for 90% fat free. Now, why do you think that is? Why do you think most people have a preference for 90% fat free? Any ideas? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, pressure makes it makes it feel good. Right. It makes you feel good to think you're having something that's fat free rather than something that has fat, even though the fact is both of the ice creams contain absolutely the same amount of fat. So that has to do with framing. How do you frame information? All the time, advertisers frame information to us in order to manipulate our behavior like an ice cream that says, you know, that, that says something like 97% fat free for you know, yogurt instead of saying 3% fat. But also the way that you frame information to others, you can think about how you're framing your communication to others because what we see and what we decide is fundamentally shaped by how we get information presented to us. So think about how you're framing information to others because you'll get different outcomes depending on how you frame information to others. So that's what you want to think about. Be intentional about what you emphasize to your stakeholders, because what I see a lot of project managers emphasizing is what is going to be needed for the project rather than what's needed for the stakeholder. So really think about the incentives and the goals, the priorities of your stakeholder. What are they trying to get? What do they want to accomplish? Think about what would make them successful to, what would make the stakeholder feel successful? Maybe think about something like, you know, what would their boss want to see accomplished? So what is the stakeholder acting to do? They want to please their boss. So think about what you can do to help them please their boss. That's kind of thinking about their goals. What is the engagement. So th focus on them, think about what they want to accomplish, frame information to them in a way that they will want 
to hear it, to help achieve their goals. So that's the framing effect. That's something I want you to be thinking about. And we often forget that this is a way that's very effective to engage stakeholders. More broadly, I want to think about why we forget these things and why we can be influenced by things like the framing effect, by things like that says 90% fat free versus 90 versus 10% fat. And that's because we tend to go with our intuitions when we hear information, when we make decisions. You know, gurus tell us to go with our gut, trust our heart, follow our intuition. And that's something that feels really good. It feels very comfortable to trust our gut when we just have information and hear it. Well, here's the information that we get and it's intuitive to listen to it as opposed to think about how is the information framed to us and how are we framing the information to others. But often trusting our gut leads to disastrous decisions because our gut is not adapted to the modern environment. It's actually adapted for the ancient savanna environment, not the modern world. The ancient savanna, when we lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people, when we had to survive based on the fight or flight reflex. And that's why we have a lot of these dangerous judgment errors, like the framing effect. They're called cognitive biases. That's a specific term for these dangerous judgment errors. Come from our evolutionary background and the wiring of our brain. So the combination of these things. One of the big sources of problems in our brain, in our thinking, is a fight or flight response to threats, which was great for hunter-gatherers, and that's ancient savanna environment, because the risks they faced were immediate, intense in the moment. Like saber-toothed tigers. You might have heard of this as the saber-toothed tiger response, when we had to jump at a hundred shadows to get away from that one saber-toothed tiger. We're the descendants of those who learned to jump at shadows, because if uh, the those in that ancient savanna environment who didn't jump at a hundred shadows were eaten by saber-toothed tigers. And so in our modern environment, we tend to be very responsive to a situation and make conclusions too quickly. But that's pretty dangerous in today's world because the risks we face are long-term, uncertain, ambiguous. It might be a notification on your smartphone about you know, a new virus coming out of Wuhan, China or something like that, right? It's not something that feels intuitively viscerally dangerous, but it can be very dangerous, it can be very impactful. So you want to question your gut intuitions. For example, a lot of project managers I talk to tell me that, hey, you know, I don't want to necessarily use this framing effect. It feels like I'm manipulating other people. Well, you know what? You're already framing the information in some way. And you, the way that you intuitively frame it might not be effective for them to hear it. So you want to frame it in a way that's effective for them to hear it. Think about your goals, think about what goals they want to accomplish, and how can you frame the information so that your stakeholders can accomplish their goals. And so focus on that, help them accomplish their goals. Okay, so that's the framing effect. Now, I want you to think about whether these cognitive biases. So thinking about cognitive biases, thinking about these dangerous judgment errors. Did you ever make a bad decision in the past? And looking back, you realize you had the information you needed to make a better decision. Let's do a poll on this. So did you ever make a bad decision? And looking back, you realize you had the information you needed to make a better decision. Please go ahead. Yes, so definitely this happened to everyone, definitely happened to me. And if you had the information you needed to make a better decision, but you made a bad decision, it's most likely that you fell into one of the many cognitive biases. So that feeling of like, oh, realizing, looking back, I had the information I needed to make a better decision, that is likely the feeling of falling into a cognitive bias. Let's go on, talk about some more of these dangerous judgment errors. One of the biggest problems I see with project managers in regard to stakeholder engagement is called the false consensus effect. We tend to believe that others agree with us, especially people who are in our tribe, who are in our in-group, to a much greater extent than they actually do. So if you think of a project that you're working on and you're involving other members of various departments in the project, 
it feels like they should agree with you. And it feels like they already do agree with you. And you tend to underestimate the extent to which they disagree with you. Especially applies to people we know well, people we perceive to be on our in-group. Remember that tribalism in the Savannah environment. It was very important for us to be tribal in that environment. If we weren't sufficiently tribal, we'd be kicked out of our tribe and we'd die. And if we weren't sufficiently hostile to other tribes, well, they take us over and we die as well. And we're the descendants of those people who didn't die. So it feels very salient and important for us to be tribal. And it feels like those people who are in our tribe should agree with us. And that's a problem because often people don't. We fail to anticipate misunderstandings and various differences of opinion of people with whom we're in a project team. So it leads to a lot of conflicts that are serious and unnecessary. And so this is the false consensus effect. Now, I'll do another poll. How valuable do you think it would be for you and your team to address the false consensus effect? Please go ahead and vote. I'll give you five more seconds to make your voice heard. Okay, so we have this clear, over half of you think it's highly valuable, that's great. Some of you think it's moderately valuable. So especially if you think it's highly valuable, this is information for you to think about where might this come up in your work and how can you bring this information back to your team? So think about this false consensus effect as a problem. Now, I'm gonna talk about another relevant cognitive bias that I've seen project managers fall into a lot in stakeholder engagement called the illusion of transparency. The illusion of transparency. We usually feel that we are effective in communicating information because we feel like, okay, I'm trying to communicate something. It feels like I'm being effective in communicating. It feels right to me to communicate it. So we feel that whatever we're communicating to others is actually coming across. But often that's not the case. Our intentions, our messages, often don't across the case well to others. So research shows that we are often much worse than we feel in communicating both the content of our message and the underlying emotions, intentions, feelings to other people. So we communicating what we mean and intend to others, often it doesn't work. We are also quite a bit worse than we feel in reading other people's messages and intentions. Now it's understandable if you think about it deeply, right? Sometimes we mishear other people or they mishear us when, especially with technical issues going on here in our modern technological environment, it's easy to mishear other people when we don't get exactly what they're saying. And so that's a problem. That's easy for us to misunderstand other people when we're trying to listen to them and understand what they're saying. That's one thing, mishear kind of, another thing is misunderstanding in terms of terminology because different words mean different things to other people. And sometimes they might not want to hear what you have to say. So they might be not listening carefully, especially if it's information they don't want to hear, they might deny the information. So they kind of misunderstand it. And a third thing that might happen is that they might hear the information, they might understand it, but they might completely disagree with you, but not tell you that they disagreed with you because they don't want to have a fight, have a conflict. So that's another thing that happens. And I've seen that happen pretty often. So the illusion of transparency can be a pretty serious issue for project managers when you're trying to go on a project and communicate to others, but you're not effective in communicating to them. So with that in mind, let's do another poll. How valuable do you think it would be for you and your team to address the illusion of transparency? Five more seconds for those who haven't participated yet. Okay, seems a little bit less popular in the false consensus effect, but clearly still important. So for over a third of you, so think about how to address this 
in your team, how to address this in your work in effectiveness of communication. That's a major issue. Next cognitive bias that I want to talk about is called the empathy gap. So the empathy gap has to do with our emotions and us forgetting that other people are fundamentally motivated by their emotions. Emotions, when you look at the research, determine about 80 to 90% of our decisions when we just go ahead and do what feels natural to us. But we really underestimate the extent to which other people are driven by their emotions, especially people who are not in our tribal group we underestimate the extent to which their emotions drive them. So we tend to assume that they are rational decision makers to a much bigger extent than they are. And we fail to predict their decisions, their behaviors. When you see people on the project team making some decisions that you're very confused about, like, why are you doing that? That seems very irrational. You have to suspect that what's going on is their emotions. Their emotions are causing them to make some decisions that don't align with your interests, that don't align with the project interests, but they have certain feelings. Maybe they're feeling anxious. Maybe they're feeling angry. Maybe they're feeling not heard. Maybe they're feeling like their interests of their department aren't bought in. Maybe they feel like you have not really thought about what their boss's boss would want to hear and would want to see happen. And they're, they have these feelings which are causing them to act in ways that are at odds with your goals, with the project's goals, but not at odds with their own interests often, but sometimes at odds with their own interests. Sometimes rationally they would be doing one thing, but because they feel anxious or they feel frustrated, they feel maybe shamed or guilty or angry because of something that happened, they act out and don't do something that's actually aligned with their own interests. Let's think about this empathy gap. How do you valuable do you think this would be for you to address? Please go ahead and vote. Okay, so this seems to be a little bit less popular. So a quarter of you thought it would be highly valuable. And then, so think about how you would take this information back to your team and what you would do in this situation, how you would address the empathy gap. Okay, so at this point, I want you all to take three minutes and think about where in your work you've seen problems caused by the illusion of transparency, the false consensus effect, and the empathy gap, and write those down. So take three minutes, write those down, and then we'll have a group discussion about them. So please go ahead, take three minutes, write those down. Think about it, take three minutes, write them down. Our pizza just arrived. If we could take a short break and just have everyone uh, grab some pizza and then we can continue. Uh, and while you're grabbing pizza, have to think about this issue and write it down. This is the perfect time to take a break. <laughs> okay, so let's take let's take a 10 minute break. I'll get off and I'll be back in 10 minutes and you have some pizza and write down the so some ideas for where this was a you can think this was a problem for you. Yes, <laughs> 
bless the whole table here. Hmm? What's that? He didn't bless the whole table. Oh. That's back when he's in for us. So he's talking about buying a, buying a shirt. Hey. Like, hey. Legs trick. Yeah. Get new shirts with their new logo.
I don't think she was married yet. So I take two grams. Yes, it was just about a year. She followed I asked for 10, I said 10 minutes. So how are you doing? Everyone's good? All right, good. So you had time to grab pizza and you had time to think about this. Now I'd like you to get into small groups of three to four people and discuss your insights from thinking about where you saw the illusion of transparency, the false consensus effect, the empathy gap be a problem for you in your project management work. So discuss this with others, talk about examples, talk about how you can address this problem. So take another 10 minutes as you're eating your pizza, hang out with people and discuss these topics. Okay, so be back and ready to discuss this at oh, in five minutes before the top of the hour. So again, groups of three to four people. Go ahead. Yeah, right. You know, 
30 more seconds, folks. Take 30 more seconds to finish up, and then we'll get into a broader discussion. All right, folks. So let's get into a broader group. All right, all right. <laughs> Not, I can't be there to <laughs> to uh, monitor folks. Come on, let's uh, get into a broader group. So, what are some insights that you've had from this discussion or in your group discussion? One thing that we all kind of frame our transparency to be transparent, but not mm. as clear as glass. It's more kind of like a polycarbonate. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you want to be try to over communicate and be a, focus on what you want to make transparent to others. Again, it's very intuitive to us that we are transparent, meaning that we are effective communicators and we are less effective communicators than we feel we are. That's why people say to over communicate, that's really important and valuable. Of course, you want to communicate, like you said, not be as clear as class, but communicate what you actually want to communicate. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Other folks? So there was a challenge of transparency that I'm facing, that, that's the reason why I came to the session. So uh, I work for a European client and I bring a risk management framework for them. And the client hired you, you get at a risk. And I'm trying, and they are, he's questioning my risk management framework quite a bit. Uh, and it actually goes back to the comment you made about, you know, the hunter gravel risk model versus the long term mm -hmm. risk model. So the risk model that I proposed was more long term, which actually talks about severity and priority rather than proximity, which is what the client wants to talk about. I have been very, very open about it that this is the reason why I'm. I'm doing this, but it has been extremely a challenging conversation because the client is a new in his role. And I'm, 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 this is kind of a real world example that I'm grappling with. How do I deal with that scenario where I have to be transparent enough to say, okay, this is, this is what the situation is. You're new in your role and you want to prove your metal. But how do I make sure that I communicate to you, you're setting up a new PU for a business in a new country. 
what is there's a lot of uncertainty. It's more long term than proximity, later, right? So that's why I've been communicating. Any thoughts you have would be appreciated. Okay. So I'll offer for people who want to, to have a coaching session with me. It sounds like a pretty complex issue. Uh, yeah. So I'll be happy to have a coaching, like a free coaching yeah. session with you to discuss this in more depth. And we can talk about the specifics of the case because it sounds like a complex case that we want to go into. So appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Other folks, other insights. Sometimes you don't want to be transparent for instance, when you're looking for a regulatory approval, you want to be you want to be accurate mm -hmm. with your information, but you don't want to be maybe totally transparent. All right. So what? Uh, so here, it's a matter of the framing effect. How are you framing the information? And you that's what you want to be thinking about. How do you want to frame it to regulators? When you're talking about the illusion of transparency, you want to be thinking about what you're communicating. Yes. So you want to communicate effectively what you want the other person to hear, not necessarily everything that you know. <laughs> right. Yep. All right. So good discussion. Let's talk about some of the ways to address these problems, overcoming these dangerous judgment errors. So you really need to go against your intuitions. Things like can feel like we want to do things one way, we want to frame information one way, but we really need to learn that our intuitions can often lead us in, in a, astray to make bad decisions because our intuitions were there to help early humans survive the savanna environment. But our brains are really not wired for making complex decisions in today's world that's really challenging and not really fit for the ancestral savanna environment. So for example, think about that ancestral savanna environment. When we came across a source of sugar, honey, bananas, apples, it was very important for us to have as much of it as possible. We were in that environment. We needed to have as many calories as possible. We're the descendants of those who, when they came across a source of sugar, they were able to eat it very, a lot of it very quickly. But in the modern environment, a lot of processed foods are not very healthy for us. So if a grateful vendor sends over a box of donuts, and sitting there in the break room. It's very tempting when you're coming by to take half a donut. And when you take it, you kind of get triggered by the sugar and you take another half a donut. Then you take another donut. Before you know it, you know, half the box is gone. <laughs> Not that it ever happened to me. This is something that you really want to avoid in the modern environment. So you need to learn healthier habits of managing your diet. Maybe skip by those donuts and go buy a bowl of, go get a bowl of fruit from another bowl of fruit that another grateful vendor sent you. You need to, hopefully in the modern environment, you figured out ways of managing your eating. You figured out ways of managing your exercise. We're not wired to sit nine to five in an office or working remotely. That's not what we're wired for. We're wired for hunting and gathering in the savanna environment. So we need to do some exercises to make sure that we're fit. So you've worked on your physical fitness, but you also need to work on your mental fitness, like addressing, figuring out those cognitive biases and addressing them, the empathy gap, the illusion of transparency, the false consensus effect, the framing effect. And to do that, you need a combination of emotional intelligence and social intelligence. Now, emotional intelligence has to do with our capacity to know and shape our own emotions, including the following abilities, awareness of what we're feeling right now in the moment, Ability to analyze what we feel and why we feel it. Managing any problematic emotions we might be feeling right now and changing our emotions in the long term to match our goals. So if we're feeling some negative emotions about a team member who's in a project with us, we need to be able to manage those emotions because they'll leak out eventually if we don't manage them effectively and if we don't shift them and change them to at least be civil and collaborative with this person who we might not intuitively like because of some gut reactions. So those are emotions we need to be able to manage. That's within us. Now, social intelligence has to do with our ability to connect with and manage other people's emotions. So our ability to influence other people. And this includes a whole broad range of skills, including assessing the stakeholders that we're engaging with, listening to them empathetically, sympathetic listening, meaning listening to their emotions. When you think about empathy, Empathy refers to understanding other people's emotions. 
then echoing and mirroring their emotions. And that's especially useful for the illusion of transparency, because then we get to figure out, are these people actually hearing what we're trying to convey? Meaning you want to mirror what they're saying and so that you figure out whether you're listening to them and you want to check with them whether they are hearing what you are saying. So ask them to echo what you're saying. So saying something like you make a statement and then you ask, so what are you taking away from the statement? You know, what does this mean to you? Asking them to rephrase the statement in their own words. Curious questioning, using questions as opposed to arguments and statements it, that are might be confrontational or conflictual is a very helpful technique to manage disagreements and to figure out what are the areas of misunderstanding and, and potential tension. Building rapport. You want to show those people that you're on their side, your stakeholders, that you're on their side. Remember, think about what their boss's boss would want to see happen here. So try to show them that you care about their interests, what their boss's boss would think, and that you're trying to help them meet those goals. And storytelling. People really understand information effectively through stories. Now, it might be tempting for you to argue. It feels right, it feels logical and rational, but if you argue, other people will become defensive, and especially if you're good at arguing. That's not a very effective approach. Storytelling, telling stories, is much more effective at communicating information and getting people on your side than arguing. Getting feedback. It might not feel good to get constructive, critical feedback from others, but it's a very, very effective technique if you want to get other people on your side to have them feel like you're listening to them and also to be able to improve your performance over time. Reframing. So we talked about framing information. So you want to be able to reframe information in a way that's, you know, if currently you're framing information that something contains 10% fat, maybe you want to frame it as 90% fat free in order to influence other people effectively. Conflict mediation and resolution. You want to know how to mediate conflicts effectively and resolve them. Again, getting into conflicts is a tense, challenging thing, and it social intelligence builds skills in addressing these problems. And finally, ethical persuasion. All of the things that we're talking about here are ethical forms of persuading others. This framing effect, addressing the empathy gap, the false consensus effect, the illusion of transparency. Now, when you're thinking about addressing stakeholders, engaging with them, here are the seven key questions for effective stakeholder engagement that I want you to be asking when you're thinking about engaging with stakeholders. What are their feelings, values, goals, and incentives? This is a critically important question. You want to figure out what are they thinking? What are they feeling? What are their goals? What do they want to achieve? What does their boss's boss want? Then think about, so their goals and incentives external. Then think about internal, what's their story? How are they thinking about themselves, their role in regard to the project, in regard to the team, in regard to their relationship with you? What is their sense of identity? What's their sense of self? Now, why should they want to listen to you? What are the incentives? You know, they might have certain incentives that might not be perfectly aligned with the project. So you want to figure out why should they care about what you have to say? What are going to be the benefits to them? Why might their boss's boss benefit from them listening to you? And what are the obstacles? What are the challenges to them listening to you? The easiest way to change someone's behavior is to remove the obstacles that they have to doing something that you want. So how can you remove those obstacles and increase the rewards for changing their behaviors in a way that's aligned and changing their thinking and feelings in a way that's aligned with your goals? How and from whom can you get feedback on your plans? So when you're thinking about stakeholder engagement, you're just going to be in your own head. It might be very helpful to get feedback from other people, maybe people in this room who are going to be your peers and who you can trust on what's something that's going on in the situation. And finally, what evidence can you assess to use to assess how well you're doing in your stakeholder engagement? So that's the final question you want to be thinking about. You don't want to simply think everything is going fine. You want to think about the evidence that you're going to use to assess stakeholder engagement. Now, I want you to get back into groups and just take five minutes now 
and discuss how using these seven questions might influence, hopefully improve your stakeholder engagement. So take five minutes to do so, to have that discussion. Please go ahead, get back into those groups and we'll be returning into a broader group in five minutes. Let, let me turn it on so I can see all the questions. <laughs>
And it's about time. Excellent discussion. I gave you a little bit more time because I heard how well good the discussion went. But it's time to get into a broader group. All right, folks. So what are your insights about using these questions in stakeholder engagement? I, I think one of the big things that we got is foundational of this mm -hmm. set is, is about trust building, right? It's about, yeah. it's about um, identifying with the person that you're trying to relate to from a human eye. Yes, exactly. Trust building and thinking about their interests, their goals, their obstacles. Also thinking about their external perspective. Where can you get feedback on your plans and evidence about how well you're doing? Mm -hmm. Good. Other folks? 
I mean, when you are trying to build trust with a client, right? Basically, the first thing you do is to offer your skills that will help them solve a problem that they're immediately facing. It might be a small problem. It might be using a, a tool set, or it might be building a framework, or something that is quick and easy. Once you help them with that, you may not, they may not expect you to produce the whole thing, but that offering that skill helps you build a trust that they you have their interest in mind, and then they will listen to you more. Then, then we are trying to, you know, want, want, want something from them, which is pretty, very common in a big project or program, which is this lot of uncertainty. Right. So you're saying offer them your skills. I would reframe that to say offer them your care and concern. So yeah. show them. So start not by simply offering your skills. You want to, yeah. you know, you want to start by offering them your care showing them that you care about their problem, you care about what they want, you care about what their boss's boss thinks, and then you use your skills to solve their problem that you care about. But you start from a position of caring, from a position of empathy, from a position of understanding their pain points. Well, mm -hmm. I think it also uh, relates to the question number three, which has the keyword of listening, right? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. if, 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 you know, one way to show the client care and empathy is to give him uh, or her the undivided attention uh, mm -hmm. to listen uh, and then, uh, you know, kind of validate and confirm the understanding that you understand the problem statement and then take it forward to, uh, you know, being able to solve it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and then, you know, that, that kind of helps with it. Uh, Absolutely. Just, yeah, a lot of listening skills uh, and observing, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The word observe, I think, is a very critical word over here because mm -hmm. I, I feel observe has a word within it, which is to serve, right? Mm -hmm. And when you observe, uh, uh, you know, and you observe with the, with the goal to be able to serve, uh, mm -hmm. That resonates to care and mm -hmm. ultimately help it solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, yes, listening and when I'm talking about the social intelligence, particularly of empathetic listening, listening for the emotions underlying the problems. What are the actual emotions that they're feeling? So, their feelings. Good. Okay, good discussions. All right. So that's what we want to discuss in this presentation on stakeholder engagement. I promised you the free post-training resources, so coaching session and free slots open, like I promised, for first come, first serve. And then I'll send you my best-selling book on stakeholder engagement, which is called The Blind Spots Between Us, How to Overcome Unconscious Bias and Build Better Relationships. So you will be able to vote on it in the poll. So you should be able to see a poll. You'll be able to vote on it. If for some reason you didn't have your smartphone with you, you can also get it from the tab, this link that I gave you, tinyurl.com. But if you, tinyurl.com forward slash DA event, but if you can vote on the poll, that's all you need. To eat. I'll send you the resources. So please go ahead, vote on the poll. And in the meantime, any final questions before we wrap up? A response to your number three, four, and five, I believe, on the previous screen. Yeah. That one of the ways I feel like I have built trust and transparency and taken my stakeholders' feelings and obstacles out of the way and why they listen to me is when I, when, when phrases, when and if I have to go to them with an issue or a problem, I never go with that open. I always have a resolution mm -hmm. to issue a problem. So that they see and understand that my concern is how to resolve that for them. I never dump it in their lap and walk away from it. So I always yes. go, you know, a solution. Or if I don't have a solution immediately, I let them know that I'm working on a resolution and solution for whatever issue it might be. Mm -hmm. so That's definitely very, very important. Yes. Mm -hmm. I like they yeah. Expect that too when you come to them with the problem. 
and you, they see that you've worked it out and you have a resolution and a time frame on it. It's always important to me that I have a, a time frame that we're going to complete. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely very important. There's a, a famous Harvard Business Review article called uh, Whose Monkey, Whose Back is the Monkey On? Talking specifically about how, making sure that when there is a problem, you don't leave it on the other person's back, that you resolve it. You can you can Google it, Harvard Business Review, monkey back article. And uh, mm -hmm. so that's kind of one part of the answer. The other part of the answer I would want to give is that you want to certainly give your client the, the solution, but you also want to say, and you probably do this, but just I want to make sure that the other people hear it, to say that, hey, here's one solution that I thought about. If you have other ideas, I'd love to hear your ideas and we can co-create a solution together because sometimes the client might think that, oh, there may be better solutions available. And if you get the client's buy-in in, in co-creating a solution, the client is usually more committed to that solution, the solution that they co-create together with you. My most frequent method of operation is to get into Visio and draw a bad solution and then put it in front of the group. And they go, oh, no, no, that's way wrong. And like, oh, I thought you didn't know what the answer was. But getting to a bad solution is the best way to get your good solution. Mm -hmm. it all apart. Yeah, good insight. Okay, any other questions before we wrap up? No, thank you very much. Uh, excellent okay. presentation. All right. Excellent. Well, you're very welcome, everyone. And for those who voted to get the resources, I'll be sending them to you by the end of the weekend. All right. You have thank a good you. day, everyone. Thank and enjoy you. the rest of your pizza and socializing. Bye-bye. <laughs> Well, I'll forward to you one.